All right, gonna get some water here, and then we'll get started. So, a couple weeks ago, when Pastor Josh asked me to fill in, I started praying, and I said, well, what are we going to talk about today? And the Lord brought to mind the scripture that we're going to look at here in a minute, Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. So, take a moment, turn in your Bibles. Uh, If you didn't bring yours, grab the one from the pew in front of you. And let's switch over to Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1 here, because we're going to talk about holiness today. So, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has taken, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. All right, let's dig in here. So, the author of this passage is the prophet Isaiah. He's, uh, he is speaking this message that was written down later. And he's talking about the time when King Uzziah, or Azariah was another name, he has died. This is approximately 740 BC. um, And Isaiah is talking to the people of Judah, and he wants them to know, hey, even though the king is dead, I was given this vision, so everybody pay attention. And he also kind of related it to the political situation that they found themselves in. Because they're mourning a king, he's passed away, and he was actually a relatively good king. As you know from the kings of Israel and Judah, some were good, some were not so great. Uzziah, he was relatively good. Um, But when kings pass away, sometimes there's a problem, because then there's a scramble for the throne. If you look in the books of Chronicles and Kings, you'll see where one king dies, and then another one comes in, and he kills all the heirs, and there's all kind of political hoopla. And Isaiah is worried about this, and I'm sure the people of Judah were worried about this as well. But Isaiah's vision is of a heavenly king, the eternal Lord God. He's seated on his throne, and he's so much bigger than anything else on the earth. There's a huge robe, there's smoke filling the temple, the doorposts are shaking, there are angels calling out to each other. I mean, if you remember a few months ago, King Charles III over in Britain, he was crowned, you know, and we got to watch that on TV, and he walks down the aisle in Westminster Abbey. He didn't have any angels yelling out over top of him. There wasn't smoke filling the abbey. He had a robe. It wasn't that big. It was, it was okay. But as we are reminded here, this picture of heaven, it's a reminder that earthly kings, like King Charles in Britain, are temporary, but God's kingship is eternal. And God is also holy. It's mentioned multiple times in this passage. These angels, they're called the seraphim, they're yelling to each other. They're calling out to each other. They're above God on his throne, and they're calling out to each other. And they're repeating three times, holy, 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 that God is holy. The only other place in the Bible where you see this actual phrase, holy, 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 is in Revelation 4, 8. That's also related to the presence of God seated on his throne in heaven. So now, remember, when this book was written, this was an oral society. They had storytelling traditions. They passed on knowledge to their kids by telling them stories. They didn't have a written Bible like we have. Those didn't come until later. So when you see something in the Bible that's repeated multiple times, that's their way of saying, hey, pay attention. You need to listen to this. So when Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, That's Jesus' way of saying, hey, listen up, this is important. So when the seraphim refer to God as holy, 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 that's conveying the significance of it. Holiness is an essential part of God's character. It is truly who he is. So what is this characteristic? What is holiness? What does the word holy mean? 
we will find that the word holy is used about 600 times in the Bible. I think that means it's kind of important. It starts in the book of Exodus, and it goes all the way through to the book of Revelation and every single book in between. Some versions even have it in Genesis, where God made everything in the beginning, and he declared it holy or good. And we see in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, God gives the people of Israel all kinds of commandments about being holy and keeping things holy, living up to his word. In the prophets, both the major and minor prophets, including Isaiah and all the others, we see about the prophets reminding Israel and Judah, hey, God is holy, and you're not living up to his standards. You need to follow his rules. Jesus, in the Gospels, he spoke about the Father's holiness all the time, over and over again. And Peter and Paul and the other apostles in their letters to the early church, they remind us that God is holy, and we need to live up to his standards. Holiness is woven throughout the fabric of the Bible. It is an important topic back then, and it's an important topic today. So, our words for the day are, the Hebrew word for holy is kodesh, and the Greek word for holy is hagios. There's your two words for the day. Go use them at lunch. Uh, you get extra bonus points if you can work that into your lunch order. Those words, kodesh and hagios, they mean to be set apart, to be clean, to be purified, to be sacred, to be blameless. So, in both Hebrew and Greek, the common thread is we see that to be holy is to be set apart, to be special. It's kind of like the good china. You know, the stuff that you keep in the cupboard and you only bring it out at Thanksgiving or Christmas or when company comes over and they're really nice dishes and then, you know, you worry about you're going to drop it and break it when you're trying to wash it, or is that just me? Uh, anyway, that's my job is washing the dishes because you don't want me cooking. Um, the other thing is uh, bathrooms, the guest towel. The guest towel in the bathroom for drying your hands. Yeah, you're not allowed to dry your hands on that. That's only for guests. Only guests with dirty hands can use that towel. You've got to use your pants or something. So, but that's what we mean by set apart. That's what we mean by holy. It's special. It's only for special use. So as we see in the Bible, with 600 usages, we're reminded that God is holy. God is holiness. It is his character. As A.W. Tozer once said, God doesn't just meet a standard for holiness. He is the standard of holiness. God set the bar, and it's himself. English Puritan preacher Thomas Watson said that holiness is the most sparkling jewel of God's crown. It is the name by which he is known. And again, that's repeated in the Bible 600 times. So in the beginning... When God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1, he imparted to them his holiness, his goodness. He did this, and as we read in Genesis 1, he creates each thing on each day, and he sits back on the seventh day, and he says, you know what? This is pretty good. I think we did a good job here. And as part of that creation, he created Adam and Eve, and they were good as well for a while. But unfortunately, both for us and for Adam and Eve, they had free will. And when you have free will, you have a choice, and they chose poorly. Because of Adam and Eve's choices, all of humanity was cast away from the holy God. They were no longer set apart. God was holy. They were not. By choosing to sin, we, even to this day, not just Adam and Eve, we choose to separate ourselves from a holy God. God cannot be around sin. He cannot abide sin. God and sin do not go together. Sin is anti-holiness, and sin is just not following God's rules for life. When we sin, we deserve and we merit God's punishment. This is because he is holy, and he has set the rules for this thing we call life. And when we break those rules, we separate ourselves from him, and we merit the punishment that he brings on us. Because as sinners who sin and break God's rules, we will be judged by a holy God. So let's look again at our text here. Isaiah sees God seated on his throne, and that's where kings sit to rule. It is his seat of power. It is in heaven, and Isaiah looks up, he sees this vision, and he starts to freak out. And let's be honest, I would freak out, and you would probably freak out too if we saw that. There's a reason whenever in the Bible, whenever angels show up, they have to say to people, don't be afraid, because you'd be afraid. 
I'd be afraid. We would freak out. So what do we see in this vision? God is on his throne, and the train of his robe, the symbol of his kingship, is filling the temple. The king's robe, it's weighty, it's heavy, it's cumbersome. Remember we talked about King Charles III, you saw on television, he's walking down the aisle towards the throne, he's got a big old robe, he's got people carrying it. It's heavy, it's bulky. You ever had a big bulky coat in the winter, and you just, you can't move, you can't get, you know, little kids playing out in the snow, they can't move their arms because the coat's too big? Well, that's, you know, that's bulky, that's what we're talking about here. It's too big for you, you can't move in it. So why would a king have a robe that he couldn't move in? Well, it's a symbol of kingship. It's a symbol of, I'm the king, I don't have to work. I don't have to do things. You don't see King Charles out there sweeping a broom, swinging a pickaxe, you know, dusting off things with a feather duster. Nah, he's the king. He's got other people to do that for him. So they have other people who work for them. The heft, the choice of fabric, the pomp, of the robe signifies their importance. So the bigger the robe is, the more important the king is. And God's robe is filling this temple. It is huge. God is the biggest king of all. Plus, he's surrounded by angels. In this passage, they are called the seraphim. This is one of a few places in the Bible that angels are referred to as seraphim. And the Hebrew word seraphim means the burning ones. So this is a flying angel that is on fire. He is flying around the throne of God. They are calling out to each other, reminding each other of the holiness of God. They have six wings. So let's take a minute and envision this. You have multiple burning creatures with six wings flying around, yelling at each other around the throne of God. I don't know about you, but I'd be freaking out too. Now, the seraphim, they are angels, but they're not angels like we think of, like when we decorate our Christmas tree and you put the nice little angel with the trumpet overlooking Jesus. Oh, that's sweet. Yes, they are angels, but they're on fire and they have six wings. Remember that. They are also sinless creatures. They were created for the specific purpose of doing God's will. They didn't have a choice. Angels do not have free will. They are perfect, and they are sinless as God made them. God said, you're going to follow these rules, and the angel said, yes, sir, that's what we're doing. And so these angels, who are sinless, they use two of their six wings to cover their face so they don't look at God's holiness. So if these angels, who are sinless, can't even look at a holy God, what chance do you and I have as mere mortal men? If we go back to the book of Exodus, in chapter 33, Moses, the original, uh, the original person who talked with God as he led Israel out of Egypt, he asked God, can I see your glory? I really want to see your glory. I really want to see your face. But in verse 20 of Exodus 33, God reminds Moses, hey, you can't look on me and live to tell about it. The unholy, even Moses, whom God talked to, who led Egypt out of Israel, who led Israel out of Egypt, the unholy man is not permitted to gaze upon the holy, or else he will be destroyed. Moses gets a compromise. He gets to look at God's backside as God is walking away and placed him in the cleft of a rock to protect him. So that's all unholy man can stand to see of holy God is his back as he's walking away. The angels who are sinless recognize that they are mere creatures. They are not the creator. They are in awe of him. They respect him. They revere him. So with two wings, they're covering their faces. And with two wings, they're covering their feet. They hide this humble part of their anatomy from a holy God. Similarly, back a few chapters in Exodus 3, God comes to talk to Moses, and he calls him, and he says, hey, come over here and talk to me. And he's in the middle of the desert. But as he approaches, God says to Moses, hey, take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy ground and is set apart. Moses cannot enter this area because he's covered in the dirt and dust of the world. So symbolically, taking off his sandals, he's saying, I'm leaving the world behind as I step into this holy place to talk with a holy God. So just as Moses can't wear dusty sandals in God's presence, the angels don't let their feet be seen in God's presence as well. We also have to humbly accept that we, as we are, are not good enough to stand before a holy God. 
So Isaiah has this vision of God. He's surrounded by flying, burning creatures that are proclaiming the holiness of God. Isaiah is shaken to his core. And not only is Isaiah shaken, the temple itself, where God is located, is shaken by the greatness of God, by the holiness of God. The whole place is filling up with smoke. Can you imagine if this place started filling up with smoke? First thing we'd do, stop, drop, and roll. Oh wait, no, that's if we're on fire. No, you get down to the lowest level so the smoke rises and you find your way to the exit. Well, the temple is filling with smoke, which represents God's glory. It's reminiscent of the smoke that filled the tabernacle of meeting in the wilderness when God came down to visit the Israelites on their journey out of Egypt. God was a cloud by day to them. He protected them from the desert sun. And when he came onto the tabernacle of meeting, he came down as a cloud of smoke and he filled the tabernacle so that only Moses could get close enough to talk with God. Everybody else stayed away. They're like, nope, not going there. So the temple is rocking, it's shaking, it's filling up with smoke. You've got flying, burning angels yelling at each other all over the place, and Isaiah freaks out. He immediately figures out that he is in trouble. He knows the rules. He's a prophet, he's been briefed on what it takes, and he knows that an unholy human cannot look at a holy God seated on a throne and live. He knows that even Moses couldn't look at God. So he's like, what chance do I have? I'm in trouble. I'm really in trouble. He knows that people who mess with God's rules, they are in for it. They can be killed. If we look at Leviticus 10, we see Aaron. He is the first priest. He's anointed by God. God says, you're going to be my priest, and you're going to minister before me, you and your family after you. Well, Aaron has a couple sons, Nadab and Abihu. And what happens to them? Well, they didn't follow God's rules for offering incense. They went into the temple. They, it says they offered strange fire. They didn't follow the rules. And what happens? God zaps them. Boom. They're dead on the spot. And even afterwards, God says to Moses and Aaron, by all who come near me, I will be treated as holy. He says, I'm not fooling around. So Isaiah knows, he knows the story of Nadab and Abihu. And actually, ironically enough, King Uzziah, who just passed away, he also got in trouble for this sort of thing, for not following God's laws. In 2 Chronicles 26, we see that King Uzziah demanded to enter the temple. His, his spirit became proud, and he said, I'm going to go into the temple, and I'm going to offer incense. I'm going to do this because... I'm special, and I'm going to do this. And the priests tried to stop him. They said, no, don't do this. Don't go there. But Uzziah wouldn't listen to them. So he grabs a censer. He throws strange incense on there. He lights it. And sure enough, God's like, nope, we're not playing anymore. Uzziah was struck with leprosy right then and there, and he had leprosy the rest of his life because he was proud, because he wouldn't listen, because he wouldn't follow God's rules. So God is not kidding when it comes to his holiness. Isaiah's realization during his vision, and in light of the things he knows about Uzziah, as well as Nadab and Abihu, he knows he's in a lot of trouble here. And he realizes this, and we see this in the passage when he says, woe is me, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. That's one thing we need to recognize here this morning and every day. We are a people of unclean lips. We need to recognize our sin, recognize our unholiness, and hopefully it won't take a frightening vision of angels to remind us of this, that we are not like God. We are not even like the angels who can't look at God either. We can't cry out because we are not holy. Our sin separates us from a holy God, and only one thing can bridge that gap between sin and holiness, and that is a sacrifice. We see that in the Old Testament there was an altar set up on the tabernacle of meeting, as well as in the temple when they built the permanent temple, and that was for sacrifices. The altar was for sacrifices of animals, because as we read in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. There's no way to bridge the gap between a holy God and sinful man without the shedding of blood. So again, Isaiah knows, hey, I'm a sinner. He says he's a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. And we see the book in Psalms, there are plenty of references about lying lips and deceitful hearts. And in the book of James, the mouth is a source of problems, and the tongue that is covered by the lips is a big issue. So the whole mouth is trouble. 
Isaiah knows this, and he's wondering, how can I, Isaiah, a sinful man, survive this encounter with a holy God without a sacrifice? So let's take a look here. And in the end of the scripture, God makes a way for Isaiah to survive this encounter. God doesn't turn to him and say, nope, you've seen the holy God. I'm going to hit you with lightning. No, he sends a seraphim, one of these burning angels, who takes tongs, and he picks up a burning hot coal from the altar, and he touches Isaiah's lips with it. Now remember, the seraphim himself is actually on fire. So how hot do you think that coal had to be for a burning angel to go, you know what, I'm going to grab some tongs, and we're just going to grab it here and take it down. So that coal had to be really, really hot. Now, I don't know if you've ever been close to a grill when it's flaming up, when there's heat. Yeah, it, it's pretty burny. I, I've, you know, come close to losing some eyebrows sometimes uh, on the grill. I can't even imagine what a burning hot coal would do to your lips. We don't know what pain that Isaiah may have gone through when that coal touched his lips. Maybe God spared him the pain. We don't know. But all we know is in that moment, that burning coal took away Isaiah's sin on his lips. Now, fortunately, today, we don't have to go out, fire up the charcoal grill, and grab a, uh, grab a burning coal to burn away the sin. Fortunately, Christ endured that pain for us. He died a shameful death at the hands of the Roman authorities. He was put there by his own people to pay a debt that he didn't owe to save us from our sin. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. And by taking our sin on himself, Jesus traded us. He imputed to us his holiness, being part of the triune God. So just remember, we cannot be holy on our own. We can't do enough good works. We can't be a good enough person on our own to measure up to God. If you compare our best day, our most holy behavior, compared to a holy God who is the holiness standards, our righteousness, our good works are nothing. They are filthy rags. Woe is me, says Isaiah. I am ruined. And woe are we. The good news is, but God. A holy God has shown us unholy people a great deal of patience. Now, he doesn't zap us each time we screw up, like Nadab and Abihu. Can you imagine, you know, people, one wrong turn and kapow, there'd be a lot less people in the world, I'll tell you that. No, God doesn't want any to perish, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of him through faith in Jesus Christ. And once we accept Jesus' gift of salvation through his blood on the cross, then we receive Jesus' own holiness. We are allowed to see God face to face. We are blessed with Jesus' own holiness. We don't need a burning coal on our lips because Jesus paid it all. The Apostle Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1.16 that God says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. So God is still, to this day, holding us to his standards. If we don't keep those standards, we are sinning. Remember, sin is breaking God's rules for life. And that sin will separate us from God. God is holy. He is set apart. So it makes us unholy, even as God is still holy. So because Jesus gave us his holiness, we can be holy like God. So how does that play out? What does that mean to be holy in our daily lives? Well, as we saw in the Greek and the Hebrew words, we need to be set apart. We have to be separate from our sins and the sinful world around us. But that doesn't mean we withdraw. We don't go off into a monastery in the, in the middle of the desert and ignore the world around us. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus was in the world. He was in Israel. He was walking around amongst all the people, amongst all the sinners. We have to go about our daily lives in a sinful world and reflect the holiness of Jesus to those around us. So we have to ask ourselves, are we following God's commands to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves? Are we making choices that reflect God's love to those around us? Are we shining the light of holiness on all those who see us? Now, a bit of warning, and just remember, when I'm pointing at you, I got three fingers pointing back at me, so I'm yelling at me too. Being holy doesn't mean being holier than thou. So we shouldn't be looking down on anyone. We shouldn't be saying, oh, well, you're, you're a worse sinner than I am. I only sin a little bit. You sin a lot over there. No, no, no. 
We are all sinners. We are all fallen short of God's glory. God wants us to reflect our holiness to others and to lift others up, not put them down. Just because they don't measure up to God's standards doesn't mean Jesus loves them any less. So don't look down on anyone. Your holiness and my holiness is borrowed from Jesus Christ, as is everyone else's. We need to be holy for God's glory, not for our own self-satisfaction. The goal of our holiness is to bring others to God and to maybe hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. It's not to lord it over those around us. Everybody needs the Lord, even us. We need to be reminded of this on a daily basis. So if you've invited Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior, are you acting like it? Am I acting like it? I'll be honest, not every day. Are we taking the time to be holy? Are we taking the time to make good choices in accordance with God's laws? Am I living in the holiness that Christ has imputed to me through his death? Remember that my holiness and yours cost Jesus his life. It's not something that we should take lightly. Isaiah knew this when he saw God seated on his throne. So let's keep that picture in mind as we go forth from this place to see God high and lifted up and to remember his holiness. Let's remember to be holy because God is holy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us here today. Lord, we know that you are holy. We know that we are sinful. And we know that we cannot reach you through our own efforts. But Lord, we give thanks that Jesus came, that he lived a perfect sinless life, and we thank you that he died on the cross to bridge the gap, Lord. We thank you that he closed the gap between an unholy humanity and a holy God. Lord, as we go forth from this place today, please help us to remember to be holy. Help us to remember that we reflect you to those around us, to a world that may not know you. And Lord, we ask that you watch over us, help us to live up to your standards, and help us to do what is right. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.